actually, Dr. Peterson was supposed to introduce our special guests today, so they've uh, decided to give me the extra burden of doing this now, really. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing my necklace today. I, uh, I told my Polynesian cousins, don't go to Arizona because you'll have to show your passport and your ID. Uh, I, I do have my passport here in case any of you might have any questions about my, where I might come from. Earlier, I uh, thank Governor Herden, uh, Herbert and uh, his econ economic development uh, team for inviting us. We had a very successful meeting with the business community in Salt Lake City. And uh, I had the honor of introducing our, our good ambassador then. I uh, come from a different perspective in terms of you're probably wondering why I'm here. Uh, I currently serve as the ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia Pacific, which includes all of Southeast Asia uh, jurisdiction and overseeing all US foreign policies uh, towards Southeast Asian countries, which includes Vietnam. My unique experience in dealing with, with, with Vietnam some 40 years ago is that I was there in 67, 68 as a soldier during the Tet Offensive. At that time, I didn't know whether I was gonna come back on a body bag or as a wounded soldier, or whatever that might be. But uh, I'm so glad the way that uh, our country has taken a different attitude towards our men and women in uniform. They're heroes. In my time, we were being accused of being murderers and baby killers and monsters and whatever you might be if you served in Vietnam during the war. And I'm still bitter about this but that's okay, we have to move on. I said that because I, uh, my capacity as former chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Asia Pacific, I held three hearings. First time in the history of the US Congress that the hearings were held. The US to clean up the mess that we left behind in Vietnam when we sprayed more than 11 million gallons of Agent Orange subjecting millions of innocent Vietnamese to in this deadly chemical substance called dioxin. Even more deadly than, uh, uh, than radio uh, uh, activity and the exposure to nuclear uh, detonations. It's a, it's a sad commentary in terms of what happens in the state of war. But that was my personal experience. For 10 years, our government did this. And yet, to this day, we pretend like it wasn't our fault. I will say no, now that uh, two years ago we celebrated 15th anniversary of the establishment of formal diplomatic relations with the Republic of Vietnam. A bittersweet experience for some of us during the Vietnam era. Uh, and yet to, to have this, I, I thought it was a, a very welcoming uh, indication as, as I was Privilege to have uh, former President Bill Clinton, Senator McCain, Senator Kerry, and I were there honoring uh, Vietnam's uh, uh, openness in terms of establishing this diplomatic relations with our country. I sincerely hope that we will continue to make this effort just as we did after World War II in the treatment of Germany and the Japan. This dear friend, and I say it's a dear friend, represents Vietnam in the most honorable way. Ambassador Kwong is a graduate of the International School of uh, Relations in Vietnam, received his master's degree from T uh, Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts University, has served postings in China, and also dealt in the negotiations involving his, uh, his government. Uh, very, very much part of the efforts made right now by the government of Vietnam to establish closer and better relations with our country. I can say more, but uh, I know you'd rather hear him, but I really want to, to thank all of you for being here. And to, I understand that we have about 50 students from Vietnam attending Brigham Young University, as I'm sure that there should be more. We have, I think, approximately 25,000 Vietnamese Americans living here in the great state of Utah which is fantastic, and I think there's yet more to come. I've never seen a people that are more gracious, more loving, and more forgiving. Uh, as I went back to Vietnam, 
you think that there will still be bitter memories and the problems and the things that, uh, for the 10 year period that our own country was soul searching whether or not we should have been there. Of course, only to have a former Secretary of Defense saying that we were wrong to be in Vietnam. I say tell that to the 60,000 lives, the American soldiers that lost their lives and their families and loved ones. Doesn't make sense. Any war doesn't make sense. And I want to say that Ambassador Kwong is lovely lady, Madam Ha. Madam Ha, please, please stand. She's uh, a... <laughs> I tell you, she's a dynamite. Uh, uh, Madam Ha received her doctorate at Switzerland in agricultural science. And one of the noted uh, authorities in, in her government uh, has done a lot of things in dealing with agricultural issues involving, and uh, I know I'll, she'll kill me if I don't in, in, uh, introduce her as well. Uh, my wife, Hina. <laughs> She's from Tahiti. I don't know if you've heard of that place. It's some island it's somewhere in the South Pacific. Um, but I, I do want to say that uh, thank you so much for joining this, uh, uh, this forum, and uh, I sincerely hope that uh, some of you will have an opportunity to visit Vietnam. Beautiful country, beautiful people. Love them as we should all love each other. I think someone once said there's, after all, only one race, and that's the human race. Thank you, Ambassador Kwong. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and uh, be patient to, uh, to, to listen to my presentation. I've been uh, visiting the States here. I've been the ambassador here for one year. And every month I try to reach out to different states uh, in the United States. And uh, whenever I go, I always want to talk with the students. And uh, it's my very first visit to Utah and uh, I'm very glad to accept the invitation to speak with you today about Vietnam and uh, the bilateral relationship between Vietnam and the United States. I am very honored to be accompanied by uh, Congressman Annie Falema, Fale Fale Mavaga and his wife. Uh, they are, you know that they are both uh, graduates from uh, uh, BYU and uh, of course, I'm very honored to have the presence of um, some very familiar faces here, and we thank you for being here. Now we have a 15, 20 minutes presentation before I give the floor, uh, so I can answer some questions. Uh, my presentation today is about the next phase of reforms of Vietnam. We'll be in uh, uh, four parts. First, a brief introduction. The second about the economic reforms, uh, third about our foreign uh, policy, and the fourth one would be on bilateral relationship. So <coughs> as Vietnam, <coughs> you know, we are part of Southeast Asia, uh, one of the most dynamic uh, uh, growth region in the world right now. <coughs> we, uh, in Vietnam, we have uh, 90 million people. We are the 13th most populous nation in the world. And uh, every year we have one more million people. We are reaching one million people uh, in 10 years. By that time, we, we, uh, our population, we surpassed that of Russia. And 90% uh, of our population is under 60 years of age, while 55% is under 30 years of age. And that's why I will repeat again that we uh, have a very high priority on HRD, human resources development. Uh, as Congressman Annie just mentioned about you know, the uh, Vietnam War, we call it in, in Vietnam, we call it U.S. War. <laughs> and uh, it ended in 19... Uh, 75, and after 1975, we have about 10 years of difficulties, very difficult situation in Vietnam, 
when you try to, because all the time in, in the past, we just focused on war, how to win the war, but no development, no real construction, no real development. So since 1986, we started our economic reforms. <coughs> and since then, for 20 past, uh, for the 25, 26 years, our GDP growth rate is always between uh, 7 to 8 percent. And uh, uh, we, uh, from uh, the centrally planned market economy, we uh, centrally planned economy, we switch it to the market economy, and now 29 countries have recognized our MES. We also have uh, placed importance, uh, attached importance to the regional economic integration. And uh, we are member of ASEAN, member of APEC, and uh, we joined WTO in 2007. Right now we are negotiating uh, FTAs with uh, EU, with uh, uh, TPP, with the uh, US, and others. So Vietnam uh, has been recognized by the UN as one of the most, uh, uh, one of the top 10 uh, reform countries in the world. It's in, 19, uh, in 2010 and 2011. And we also been ranked by CNBC as among the top uh, uh, seven most attractive destination for uh, foreign investment. Here is some data about economic and trade successes in Vietnam. We are now number two uh, in rice export in the world. Uh, before 1986, we are rice importer. The hunger, always the most urgent task for our government is how to uh, feed the people. So after reforms in 1986, we started, right then, we started to be, to not only enough uh, rice, food for the people, but we started to export rice. Last year, we export about 7 million tons of rice after Thailand. But this year, uh, uh, we, uh, the Thailand say that they, they are, they, they might be that Vietnam, we, 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 we be the number one rice exporter in the world, uh, overpassing uh, Thailand. And also number one in coffee, uh, number two in coffee export, uh, number one in pepper export, and number one uh, in pepper cashew nuts, etc. That's a few figures. But, uh, we think that uh, the past uh, 25, 26 years, our reforms is mostly on the extensive, based on the extensive development. When we think that now, right now, we need to enter the second phase of reform. We call it, that's why I call it the next phase of reforms. And uh, we think that we need to have a new model of development from extensive to uh, a balance between extensive and intensive uh, uh, development and radially would be an intensive development. And second thing, we need to restructure our economy. We think uh, mm, with the restructuring economy, we focus on three things. First, about the investment. Uh, in the past, Investment in Vietnam mostly would be this public investment, get the most. And we think that we have to change that. Uh, the second thing, we, uh, we restructure our state-owned enterprises. In the past, in 1990, I remember, we have about uh, 12,000 SOEs, 12,000. Right now, we have 1,000. And we want to reduce the number of uh, SOEs by half by the year 2050. So restructuring the, the, uh, the uh, SOEs is one of the most important tasks in Vietnam right now. And uh, uh, 
even in the SOEs, we now try to equitize all the SOEs in Vietnam. The uh, third uh, priority in restructuring the economy will be on the financial and banking system. And right this year, you see a lot of uh, measures in Vietnam is the government is adopting to finance, uh, to uh, restructure our finance and banking system. So we think with that uh, new uh, level, a uh, new uh, model of development with the restructuring of the economy, we hope that by the year 2020, uh, as our socio-economic development strategy uh, for 20. Uh, uh, 11, 2020, uh, points out that we want to be a, a basically an, in, an industrialized nation by 2020. So very ambitious program, a very ambitious plan for Vietnam, but we work hard for that. So what about our foreign policy? You know that uh, as for our foreign policy, it's just the extension of the domestic policy with the uh, high determination for uh, further reforms. Uh, it must be that must be reflected in the foreign policy of Vietnam. So last year, the Party Congress, we have uh, mapped our foreign policy to strive for the interests of the nation and people, and for a stronger, pros prosperous, socialist Vietnam. Uh, we have nine, five new, I just want to mention about five new developments in our foreign policy. First, about the national interest. Everybody, every country has to take care of national interest. But for the first time in our, uh, in our uh, uh, strategy plan, we, we say that national interests are the ultimate goals and the highest principle guiding foreign policy of Vietnam. Yes. And uh, that's the new thing. In national interest, we talk more about, uh, um, we consider three things. First, about the um, security. Second, about development. And third, about the prestige of the country. And second, and uh, new developments in our foreign policy is that the international integration. If in the past we just emphasized on economic integration, economic integra international e integration, but from last year we now say integration without the word economic international integration. What does it mean? It means that we, we feel the need to have the comprehensive integration with the world, not only economic. Economic integration is the, the number one but we need to integrate into the world in other things, political, security, and social, and cultural things as well. So it's more like a comprehensive integration in the world. And the third point, new developments in our foreign policy, we focus, we lay importance in, is that we want to be a responsible member of the international community. By that, we were chair of ASEAN by 2010, uh, in 2010, and uh, we are a member, non permanent member of the UN Security Council in 2008, 2009, and uh, we see more, more of a responsible role with Vietnam in the international arena in the years to come. The third uh, new development that more focus on ASEAN. Uh, as a member of ASEAN, we are committed to together with other nine uh, Southeast Asian nations to be ASEAN as a community by 2015. And the third point, uh, the fifth point in our foreign policy is that we would like to carry out, to implement our foreign policies in a synchronous and, and uh, comprehensive ways. That means that only, not only the foreign ministry is, is is playing part, is implementing foreign policy. But other agencies, the Ministry of uh, Defense, Ministry of Public Security, and other agencies are also part of the uh, foreign policy implementation, implementation. And not only the central government, but also the provincial governments taking part. So people to people diplomacy as well. So I think that there will be more role 
uh, for all of us here to, to play in that part. So here are some of the major achievements in our foreign policy, uh, foreign relations. Now we have 100 uh, uh, diplomatic relations with one more, almost 200 countries. And uh, we uh, uh, have the strategic relations with China, Russia, UK, Japan, South Korea, India, Germany, Spain, and uh, under discussion for strategic partnership with France and the United States as well. So just mention a few things. Now let me turn to the US-Vietnam relations. Uh, Congressman Annie just mentioned about the 15th anniversary of our bilateral relationship. So our slogan is put behind the past, the world behind. Look forward to the future. We uh, established diplomatic relations in 1995, and uh, President uh, Bush visited Vietnam, President Bill Clinton visited Vietnam, and uh, I re visited Sweden uh, uh, when uh, the State Secretary of Sweden asked me about the bilateral relationship between Vietnam and the United States. So I just mentioned that, you know, uh, Bush was in Vietnam, Clinton was in Vietnam, so he told me that, oh, you don't need to talk anymore about relations with the US. I know how fast it develops now, because you know, given the close relations between Sweden and the United States, no US, pre no US president visit Sweden. <laughs> so, so in 2010, uh, Secretary Clinton visited Vietnam twice, and uh, she proposed to uh, yeah, she proposed to, uh, to alleviate, alleviate our relationship towards the strategic partnership, and the two countries are now discussing about the contents of what should be a strategic partnership between Vietnam and the United States. So just some pictures about the, how hectic the exchanges of visits. And so on political defense security, we have a normal, uh, 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 solid basis of development uh, in our bilateral relationship. And in uh, 2010, the first US naval ship serviced in Cameron Bay. And I met Senator John McCain, who was very happy to see the ship, his, the naval ship under uh, his grandfather's name. Uh, is uh, was on back on you know on the Vietnamese uh, territory waters, and uh, uh, la last year, uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense of Vietnam and the State Part and then the Department of Defense, uh, for the first time, they signed an MOU of uh, cooperation. They identified nine areas of cooperation in the defense defense relationship. So the George Washington aircraft carrier that we visited in South China Sea in 2011. Now trade investment um, and uh, investment. So we signed BTA in 2001, and uh, uh, last year the BTA uh, the trade between the two countries grew 12 times since we signed the BTA. Uh, when I met President Obama to present my credentials. I, uh, I, I told him that, Mr. President, I know that uh, uh, you have the NEI, the National Export Initiative, and you have chosen Vietnam as one, 12, one of the 12 target countries to implement your NEI. And I assure you that you will surely achieve your goal of doubling US exports in five years. He was, of course, very happy to hear that. But I'm not exaggerating. Because given the fact that the two countries' trade grew 20, 25 uh, percent annually, so I think that uh, you can uh, achieve the goal. And since, 19, uh, since uh, 2010, U.S. became number one exporter of benefits and agriculture, agricultural products to Vietnam. Now, agricultural products uh, accounts for 30 percent, 36 percent of our bilateral trade. So. And now, the two countries are negotiating on the TPP, the Trans 
Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership Agreement, which the U.S. said that it would be the 21st century you know, trade agreement. And uh, uh, I met with the vice chairman of Nike. He told me that, you know, 40% uh, of Nike sports shoes are now produced and are now made in Vietnam. When they bring their shoes back to the United States, they are subject to 35 to 40% tariffs rate. If TPP is concluded, tariff rate reduced to zero, then you can ima imagine that how would you know, Nike investment in Vietnam would, 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 would increase. And I think that the TPP is concluded, it will he open huge opportunities for business from both countries. And among nine countries are negotiating TPP, uh, eight, eight countries are negotiating with the U.S. We, uh, if we combine eight countries together, our trade with the U.S. already no, ranked number, number three uh, in U.S. trade with the world. So TPP is very important uh, in uh, endeavor for the Vietnam and uh, U.S. in the years to come. So we see the figure how trade jumps goes up uh, between the two countries. The firms, U.S. firms are doing business in Vietnam. You see all the familiar names, big names here. And now about the humanitarian co cooperation, I would like to say two things. First of all, MEI. The U.S. has always said that they are, you are grat gratified to Vietnam uh, in our cooperation to am um, on the MIA issues, and so far we have already one more, over 100 John carrying missions conducted with more than 600 remains of uh, 800 remains of American military personnel repatriated, and uh, also the and uh, the question of the orange uh, uh, Agent Orange as you mentioned, and here I have a good picture of a Congressman Annie, who is very a pioneer person. You know, on the Agent Orange uh, issues between our two countries. Another area of our cooperation will be on education, science, technology. Right now we have 15,000 Vietnamese students in the United States. We rank number 13 and number eight uh, among all countries sending students to the U.S. Among, and we rank number one among ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries sending you More Vietnamese students in the U.S. now than Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines in the U.S. Students in the U.S. And you want to send more. And you also want to invite U.S. universities, uh, go to Vietnam, open your own branch, your own faculty, or even your own university with your own curriculum, your own professors to teach in Vietnam, in English, of course. So that's a few remarks from me for bilateral relationship. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, we'll be willing to answer some questions if you have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. is willing to take a few questions. We have a microphone at the back yeah. of the room. I understand you can all hear us, but for the purposes of the podcast and recording, we need to have you on the mic. So please uh, let us know your name, what you're studying here at the university. Uh, the ambassador also recognizes that uh, with his academic background that we're prisoners of the class period. So we'll take uh, <laughs> questions until 10 to the hour, at which point we'll cut the questions off. So go ahead, please. Hi, uh, th thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, uh, it's great to hear uh, an update on Vietnam. Um, I, my name is Dave Engler. I'm in the Department of Statistics, but I actually have a question about uh, your uh, um, description of the, your economic plan. Uh, so within the past 20 or 30 years, this, this has actually been, been uh, it seems like this has been uh, a common challenge faced by, by a lot of countries seeking to enter into a, a period of, of strong economic development, right? This transition from 
um, government supported interest, industries which which is important for you know initial development I mean these a lot of industries need uh, these extra protections when they're when they're first uh, when, yeah, when in trying to establish a foothold in the world economy um, and, and moving eventually to to privatization mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of countries a lot of con countries within the past 20 or 30 years have kind of gone through this process uh, some more successfully than others and I guess I, I'm wondering um, when, when you look at these countries, is, is there a country in particular or a set of countries that, that you're seeking to, who, you know, whose economic development plan you're seeking to model or are seeking to follow? Thanks. Okay. Shall I take one or two more questions and answer? Okay. I'll go one by one, yeah? Okay. So, uh, yes, I think that uh, uh, when we're talking about our, our uh, uh, development model, we have to... Uh, also look at other countries, what they are doing. And we also talk uh, with our, with the donors country, uh, uh, and also talk with the World Bank, NMF. We listen to all the advices, but of course we choose our own. So I don't think that uh, Vietnam is adopting any, any, anyone's for, you know, model uh, for development. Of course we learn from each, from we learn some from this, that country, China, we learn some from Korea, we learn some from others. But uh, we have our own circumstances, so we have our own way of development. My name is Michelle Rubio, and I am studying public relations. My question is for you is how did the government and the people of Vietnam after having, having war with the United States, even though it was back in the 70s when it ended, how did you make that peaceful amendment? And how do you, how do you just completely get over the past and look forward mm. to the future? Because a lot of countries that have had war mm. still maintain this bitter, this bitter relationship or this bitter feeling on a local level and also on the governmental level. So how did Vietnam, mm. how did Vietnam do it without reserving any bitterness? Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a very interesting question. How do you do that? And. Uh, I think it's not an easy to answer you in a short, uh, in a f just a few minutes. But you know, Vietnam has been gone, uh, has b has gone through wars for only ten years, for a decade with the U.S. for thousands of years, hundreds of years, and we know that we cannot live with hatred. We have to go on, live uh, to to move on. You know, as Congressman Ioni just mentioned. So why we just look at the past? with uh, hatred, grudging, something like this. Uh, we need, need to move on. So that's what is the spirit of the nation. And it's uh, some kind of, you know, in, the, in the everybody's mind like this. I tell you a story about that. You know, <coughs> it was very moving story about American, uh, about a Vietnam, American mother. He went to, she went to Vietnam to look for the remains of her son died in, during the war. And finally she found her remains, uh, the remains of her sons in a, uh, in a peasant, Vietnamese peasant's home. And uh, uh, the Vietnamese lady looked after uh, the, her son's remains in a tomb uh, every, every month, like a Vietnamese way. In, uh, and, uh, and she then uh, la later she found that the Vietnamese lady also lost her son uh, during the war. And she asked, why you look after my son's remains like this when you haven't found your son's remains and your son died because of the war? And the uh, Vietnamese lady said, you know, I understand that although I haven't found my son's remains, but I know that my son's remains will be, are being taken care of by some uh, other families. So I, as a mother, I need to take care of a, of a son's, you know, of your son's uh, remains in here. So I think that's the, I mean, I, I, I want to tell you like this because it's, I think, not only the policy, <coughs> the government's policy, but it's the people's you know, determination and you know, characteristics of the Vietnamese people, you know, of uh, forgiveness. That's one of the most important thing, and we have to move on. Thank you. Yeah, hello, I'm Rafi Mercury. I study history here. 
Um, <clears throat> I just had a question about education in Vietnam. What kind of funding does the Vietnamese government give to undergraduate students at, uh, in Vietnam, and, and what importance does the government... Yeah, funding? Yeah. yeah. And, and what importance does the government give to um, mm. higher education? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, as I, am, uh, I uh, said earlier, the, uh, uh, now we, in our new, in our 10-year development, we think we need uh, to focus on three areas. First, about refining our legal institutions and mechanisms in accordance with the word, you know, rule, uh, uh, WTO, and so on. The second thing about the, to build up an uh, integrated infrastructure, because we think that after 25 years of development, infrastructure development is lacking behind, and it's a hindrance to our uh, further economic development. And third point is about you know, the human resource de uh, development. And that's why the government is, is, you know, is paying much, much attention and give very high attention to the education of our uh, young people. And uh, uh, for the, we, in Vietnam, in the past, we didn't, we don't have any, we didn't have any plan uh, to, uh, to let the students here, undergraduate students, to borrow money. But uh, I think for past se several years, we started to let the Vietnamese students borrow money, when if they are from poor ma family, they can borrow money from the government to pay for their tuitions, you know, and go to the graduate, uh, uh, to, to universities. And it's a very big program in Vietnam. And <coughs> we also have a plan, uh, which we did it, that we have the internet coverage for all schools, not only universities, but all schools in Vietnam, from uh, not only in urban cities, uh, urban areas, but in the rural areas, in mountainous regions as well. So now all schools in Vietnam have the internet access. You know, who pay for that? Just one, one Vietnamese company. They are willing to pay for all these uh, costs of the internet coverage for all the schools in Vietnam. And I remember they pay about $20 million a year for that. Uh, it's very generous uh, gesture. Another question? Good morning, my name is Greg. I'm a Middle East Studies Arabic major. Um, my question is, how um, is Vietnam finding a balance between like, maintaining, its, maintaining socialism and instituting these new reforms um, and making an open market? Mm, yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we think that our uh, reforms is a market economy is a is a, is a, like a, a asset or something like for all countries not in the past you mentioned market economy is a capitalist socialist economy uh, socialist is a planned economy you know central planned now we think that common uh, uh, the market economy is good for all yeah and uh, as for socialist, uh, socialism we mentioned, uh, I think that we share the same values. That's the happiness, the better life for, of the people. That's the main, main, main idea about socialism. Better life, better welfare, and better care uh, of the people's life. Hmm. Yeah. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to BYU. My name is George Bowie and I'm the CEO of Eco Recovery Systems. Uh -huh. uh, for those of us who've had the opportunity to spend time in Vietnam, we realize how beautiful a country it is. Yes. And one of the uh, aspects of your economy that is growing quite strongly is tourism. Yeah. Uh, you had referred to the infrastructure answering a previous question that's still being developed and being taken care of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to know what policies and procedures the government is implementing to handle some of those infrastructure concerns that you have, mm -hmm. especially as a burgeoning economic uh, country, we have a lot of increase in things like garbage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you handle that? And how yeah. do you deal with landfills that uh, yeah. are overflowing yeah. uh, to maintain the beauty of the country yeah. and yeah. encourage more yeah. tourism? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, 
in, in tourism is really an important industry in Vietnam now. And we know uh, just uh, yesterday, the Ha Long Bay of Vietnam has been recognized as the uh, new, uh, seven new wonders of the world. And uh, been recognized by UNESCO as World Her Natural Heritage and, uh, already. And uh, of course, as uh, developments in the country, also a lot of things we have to tackle with, like uh, waste and something. And, and, and all these things, environmental protection, big things in Vietnam right now. And uh, we, the government recognize it, uh, importance of the, you know, the protection, environmental protection for, uh, for our development and also for tourism. And you are cooperating with other countries. So if you have any programs about how to help Vietnam to deal with the issue, like you mentioned, the waste uh, uh, treatment, uh, we, we would be willing to, to hear from you, you know. And uh, we are working hard on that a lot for tourism. Is, I know that for, to promote tourism in Vietnam, a lot of measures, a lot of things we need to do, not only dealing with tourism, but also the attitude, train people, attitude, pe uh, educate people, uh, and so on. So many things, but uh, it's a huge program in Vietnam. My name is Emily Jensen. I'm a biology major here at BYU. I'm actually kind of wondering, um, what are the long-term ramifications biologically of uh, dioxin, the Agent Orange um, bombings on, on Vietnam? Mm -hmm. are, are there any big ones? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think Congressman Annie can explain it more clear than I do. But uh, we think that, uh, yes, uh, it's a real, real issue about the cleaning up the mess, as uh, colleagues and um, any, any just mentioned. But we have uh, uh, now better and bet better cooperation with the U.S. Uh, uh, Congress, U.S. Uh, government, and uh, NGOs to deal with the issue. Before I came here, uh, I, I went to the United States as, uh, to take uh, up my ambassadorship. Uh, I went to Da Nang to visit the spot site uh, of Da Nang Airport, you were there, and also visiting some of the uh, families, some of the kin children uh, being affected by Agent Orange. It's very, very, very devastating in Vietnam, still right now. So we are calling the U.S., paying more attention to the issue, giving more and more efforts, you know, and assistance to deal with the issue. The Vietnamese government is paying a lot of money to, to, to clean up, you know, to do in the cleaning up and to help the uh, victims of Agent Orange. But we also call on the U.S. to do more. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just add also, uh, with the long-term implications of this deadly chemical substance, dioxin, like I said, it's, uh, <coughs> it's generational. And the problem here is that if you don't clean them, go even to the subsoil level yeah. in getting rid of this uh, chemical substance, it will... Uh, get into the biological functionings of, of human beings and especially mothers. And I've been to several hospitals and uh, uh, I can tell you uh, it's uh, not exactly a very positive experience of what happens to, to, to uh, people. And the problem here is that uh, it isn't just the, 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 the our Vietnamese, but even uh, many of our soldiers were exposed to, uh, to a chemical uh, substance dioxin and the, on Agent Orange, and the sad part about it is a commentary is that our government just has not been responsive. Uh, added to that problem that we created a mess also of dropping some six million pounds of ordnance and bombs on Laos and Cambodia, which we never really are, <laughs> they never even declared war against us. That's another issue that uh, we just kind of wash it under the rug and pretend like it doesn't exist. It's really sad. And I have been trying, uh, Senator McCain and other members of Congress, we have been trying to, to, to get uh, the Congress, our government, to uh, put more of our resources to help clean up the mess that we created. The sad part about it is, like I said, is it, we did this for 11 years. Despite all the, 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 the information that say, hey, something's wrong here. And uh, the next generation of our soldiers who were there from 61 to 71, this is gonna be another big issue that's gonna come up 
uh, for soldiers who, like I said, uh, it doesn't happen here, but it may happen another 20 years in terms of the results of, when you've seen deformed babies with no legs, no arms, one eye, and all of that in baby bottles, of women giving birth as a result of dioxin, uh, it, it's, it's, it's telling. And uh, I'm just saying that it's sad that our government has not been responsive in cleaning up the mess that we created there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We appreciate Thank it very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.